I know you're probably asking, why am I showing you this? And it kind of all has got to do with this fascination I've developed, with the way in which housing can intersect and reflect other areas of our society. This story doesn't start in 1954. As in the early 20th century, the Highlands were still a predominantly rural economy, where land industries such as fishing and farming made up the majority of employment. And this is important as it provides a definitive point in the narrative where housing wasn't a commodity that we understand of it today, but a right that you would gain through your employment. But everything changes in 1954 with the catalyst of a new industry and economy about to transform the small town. And so nuclear power was about to become this revolutionary factor in the rural economy. And the impending power station was about to create 6,000 new jobs in the area, which would mean that the population was about to treble from 3,000 to 9,000. And this gets interesting as this change in the predominant industry directly impacted the social demographic of the town, which allows us to put housing's relevancy to other areas of society in context. As housing is no longer just a right for an individual that sits separate, it becomes this incentivised cog in the much wider machine of infrastructure which was engineered to work intrinsically to the needs of the industry. This industry required 850 new homes. And the atomics were more than a solution to the need for shelter, with an emphasis on social mobility designed into their system. With a mix of six typologies, from two-bed flats to four-bed homes, we can start to understand the social structure engineered into the architecture. The documents which supplement the homes provide insight into why this is a definitive feature in regard to our relationship with housing. Payment for each home came from a percentage of your wage, which meant that housing was to be attained not on just monetary wealth, but your rank within the plant. Despite the obvious implications this relationship had on plant productivity, it also affected other more social areas of society. And this is when we can start to see how a housing model, not too dissimilar from the early 20th century model, can become an active catalyst in advancing a society not just economically but socially. Having a housing system that allows for social mobility drives a need for accompanying infrastructure such as schools and colleges. We can then start to really appreciate how housing, which retains people, can create a foundation of a thriving society. But something happened that sold off this inclusive model. Anyone who wants to own his own home can expect help from a conservative government. And we know what that help will cost. It won't be cheap, especially at a time when money is tight. But it's a question of where you spend government money. And we spend it where it is needed, and we know it's needed in housing. And I recognise that the Atomics forged an exceptional example to how housing interacts with industry and society, but in a way this only highlights the disastrous effect of the right to buy scheme. The right to buy turned the 1954 housing model upside down, where social mobility no longer served to benefit collective society but the individual. Homes were no longer the transitory vehicles of mobility but symbols of monetary commodification and residualisation became a direct result of the right to buy, with those who had benefited from the atomics capitalising on them. The dismantling of the atomics only strengthens their importance. The subsequent decline of population and opportunity has only served to highlight the foundation housing holds in the advancement of society.